Okay, so now we're going to get on to chapter six. And chapter six is actually a pretty easy chapter. This has to do with um, cell structure. And so what we're going to talk about are the different organelles and the, and the different types of cells and that type of stuff. So um, in order for a cell to be a cell, there's a couple of things that they're all going to have in common. So the first thing they're going to have in common is genetic material in the form of DNA. So all of them are going to have DNA as their hereditary material. Now in prokaryotes, which are going to be a type of cell we're going to talk about in a second, those are bacterial cells. They're not going to have a nucleus, they're just going to have a region where the DNA is kind of floating around and that's called, called the nucleoid. Um, in eukaryotes, which are the type of cells that we have, like plant cells, animal cells, those types of cells, we are going to have our DNA inside the nucleus. <clears throat> okay, so all cells have to have genetic material in the form of DNA. Second thing is they have to have cytoplasm. And cytoplasm would be like, if you think about a cell, if you were to like squish it and like that little jelly stuff would come out, that's what cytoplasm is. So it's actually really nutritious. It's got, you know, um, amino acids and carbohydrates and that type of stuff in it. And so that's what everything inside the cell is kind of floating in. So it's like a jelly-like material. Um, the parts of the cell, like nucleus and, you know, the mitochondria and those types of things, those are going to be called organelles. And so the organelles are sitting in that cytoplasm, if you have organelles. Okay, so genetic material, cytoplasm. Third thing is going to be a plasma membrane. So all cells are going to have this um, cell membrane called a plasma membrane. And it's going to be really important because that's what regulates what comes into the cell and what goes out of the cell. So very important that that functions correctly or else you could have some sort of an issue. Um, so we're going to get into membrane components in, a, in the next chapter. So we'll get into how the different proteins and all of that are going to work. Then the last thing that all cells are going to have are going to be ribosomes. And ribosomes are going to be really important, as you'll learn later, because those are going to be what allows us to take our DNA and actually make it into something physical. So your DNA is just a code, and we're actually taking that code and using that to make something physical. So ribosomes are going to do that. Okay, so let's talk about cell theory. These are just some facts about cells. First of all, anything that's considered to be a living organism is composed of one or more cells. And in those cells, in order to be considered to be alive, you have to have two things happening, metabolism and heredity. So they have to be able to pass down their genetic information, and they have to have some sort of metabolic activity keeping them alive. All right. Um, number two, really important point. Cells are the basic unit of life. Sorry, that's my lovely alarm. Um, so what that means is the basic unit of life is a cell. If there's anything you're going to get from this class, that's going to be the important one, okay? Cells are the basic unit of life. And then the third thing is that any cell that's on Earth right now comes from the division of a pre-existing cell. So anything that's living comes from something that was once living, right? So you can't just have something coming, popping up out of nowhere. Okay, now let's talk about the size of a cell. Cells are actually really small, as you know, because you've seen that in lab. And there's a reason for that. Um, because the smaller the cell is, the closer all those organelles are to one another, and then they can pass things back and forth and across the membrane a lot more efficiently. Um, and don't forget, even though in your book it looks like a cell is flat, and some of them are kind of flat, they are a three-dimensional um, structure, and so they are going to increase in volume as they increase in surface area as well. So that's important to think about. Now there's two types of cells. We've got eukaryotes, which are the type of cells that we have, and prokaryotes, which are bacteria. And eukaryotes are going to be about 10 to 100 mic micrometers in diameter, and they're going to be about 10 times bigger than prokaryotes. And the main reason for that is because prokaryotes don't have any of those organelles, those little parts inside, and so they don't really need all of that space. And they're going to have a different makeup as well that we'll talk about. Okay. So if we wanted to look at cells under the microscope, there's a couple of ways that we can do it. What we have here at CCD is a compound microscope. And a compound microscope is going to magnify that specimen using lenses. Um, so if we look at this picture here, actually this is a good picture to show you the three different types of cells. So here's a plant cell, here's an animal cell. Both of these are eukaryotes because they've got all that junk inside of them that we're going to talk about. Cool thing is, by the end of this chapter, you're going to know what all of those things do. 
And then on the bottom here, that's going to be a bacterial cell or a prokaryote. And you can see it's smaller and it's much simpler, right? It's just got that DNA floating around and a couple ribosomes. Okay. So if we're using a compound microscope, these look like cheek cells right here. This is how the image is going to look. So um, you can see the cell. And the nice thing about it is that compound microscopes are a lot cheaper. And um, you can keep the specimen alive, like we did with um, those little guys who were zooming around, right? So that's the benefit of a compound microscope. Um, then, if you want to get more detailed, you can look through what's called a transmission electron microscope. And what that one is going to do is shoot electrons through the specimen so that you can actually see the internal structure of a cell. And the way that's going to look, oh, let's see, where is, is like this picture down here. Um, so what that is is cilia, like the little hair-like structures, and you're actually seeing what the inside of those cilia look like. Now the next type is a scanning electron microscope, and that actually shoots electrons off of the surface of a cell. And the point of that is that you can actually see what the surface of the cell looks like. So it's kind of almost like sonar, like how that works. And so back to this picture again, this top picture is going to be a scanning electron microscope. They're actually looking at the same thing, um, but you can see how this is more of a 3D image and how this one is a flat image, but you can see what's going on inside. So bottom is transmission electron microscope, and then the top is a scanning electron microscope. Okay, now if we're looking through a compound microscope, which is that first one we talked about, um, sometimes you might want to use stains, and stains are just going to allow you to see something more easily. So if we go back here to this picture, um, you can see, actually, no, this is better. <laughs> okay, so you can see these cells, most cells are clear. And it's really hard to see what's going on inside that cell. But here, that same cell has been stained, and now you have more of a contrast, so it's easier to find them on the slide, and it's easier to see the parts. Now, there's other fancier types of staining, like you can use fluorescence. That's a really nice um, stain cell, and that's the same type of cell. It's just been stained with fluorescence. Um, and, yeah, that's fluorescence right there, too. So staining is really important because that does help you to see things a little bit more easily. Now sometimes, and actually we're going to do this later in the semester, um, what you can do is what's called cell fractionation. And that's putting cells into a centrifuge, which is like a really, really, really fast merry-go-round for test tubes. And so you put the cells in there, and if you spin it fast enough, there are like specific speeds you can set it to, you can actually break the cells apart and get certain organelles to settle down at the bottom. So cell fractionation is a way that you can kind of separate out different parts of the cell. All right. So let's, uh, in this next part, we're going to talk about the different types of cells and um, the way that they work.